Uh, we'll be back to the Niagara Creed this morning. So if you have a copy of that, make sure you have the Niagara Creed. If you have a Bible, Matthew chapter 5, um, you'll need that. And then um, you may need uh, the Westminster Confession of Faith, but we will see. All right. So Niagara Creed, Matthew chapter 5, possibly a copy of the Westminster Confession. And, uh, well, we have a lot to do this morning. All right. This is what, I think, part 19 in our study of the Niagara Creed. And uh, last week we did things a little different. Try, I'm constantly trying to explain to you why studying a creed is so important, especially when you see how society works and, and the church works and all the different influences and the different directions that can pull the church in different directions and how Christianity is always, in a, ten, in a, in a sense, being redefined. All right. Well, we're in a section of the creed that to me is is one of those sections that we could just if we're not careful, we could just easily overlook. We could just easily overlook because we're all very familiar with it. But maybe sometimes when when you least expect it, uh, there is a a. There's a doctrinal issue that you need to pay attention to, so we need to pay attention to it. And I kind of give you an illustration of this. Right now, right kind of near our house where you get on the on-ramp to go up on Interstate 83-84, there's a stop sign literally on the on-ramp, and they're doing some construction work. Well, if you've been driving that way, like all the years that I've been driving that way, you don't, exp- I mean, it's hard for me to remember that there's a stop sign right there. And I don't know how many times that I've gone up there, you know, it's on ramp. I'm, I'm starting to speed up 60, 70 to get ready to get on the highway. And also I'm like, stop sign. And I have literally slammed on the brakes and slid through that stop sign already twice. Thank goodness, you know, there was no other car, haven't hit anyone. But yesterday we were getting ready to take, uh, we were getting ready to pick up the rental car so Stacy could take uh, Kate to Dallas to catch a flight back to Boston. So we we got ready to go up on the on ramp. Stacy reminded me there's stop sign. I'm like, oh, okay, good. There, thanks for reminding me. So I, I stopped and I'm, I'm sitting there and we're just getting ready to go. And I for I, I try to look in the rearview mirror as much as possible just because you know that's keep yourself safe. And I just looked up in the rearview mirror and here's this big truck coming behind us and it. It's moving. It's moving. And there's clearly, if I try to go, I, there's no way. Like, if I, if I try to go, he's not going to be able to stop. And Kate's in the back seat, and she's going to be dead. She's going to be dead. It's not, it's not going to be pretty. So I just yanked the car to the left and just hit the gas and got out of the way. And that, car, and that truck just slid right, right through the stop sign. Could not stop. So, I mean, we we're very, very fortunate not it's just a bad place for a stop sign because if you've been driving that way for any length of time, you know, yeah, you just, yeah, I mean, it's really weird. And so, because that's when you start speeding up and it's like, whoa, where did that come from? And I know that there, there's probably signs back there warning you that it's coming, but you just don't pay any attention. Uh, it's like, yeah, it's like if you, uh, y- y'all got weird stop signs now in Tuscola and places like, I'm like, where? I'll be, I'll just drive right through it. And I'm like, oh, that was a stop sign. Okay. Well, okay. Wasn't there, wasn't there for 20 years. <laughs> yeah. At least I'm not speeding up to get up on a highway. So it was, you know, it, we, we missed the accident, but it just demonstrates that sometimes you're not prepared for what's coming and then boom, you know, you can, you can get hit. And so you have to be looking, you have to be looking. And as Christians, we have to be looking, we have to be paying attention to what's happening within Christianity because sometimes there's a little something something is changing something is shifting and you don't even realize it and and you can you can you we can go from doctrine to doctrine to doctrine seeing that but I wasn't prepared yesterday when I was uh, reviewing I'm doing I've been reviewing sermons on the Sermon on the Mount and from a church in Council Bluffs Iowa that I have friends that attend. And they told me, hey, we're, our church is going to be doing this series on the Sermon on the Mount. And I was like, okay, I'll use that and we'll do our own kind of mini study on the Sermon on the Mount. And his, his approach to the Sermon on the Mount has already been troubling. But where, what he did yesterday was like looking in the rearview mirror, think you're about to be hit. And it's like, what, what is happening? And I think we can all agree that a very fundamental doctrine to Christianity, a, one of a fundamental doctrine to the church should be the doctrine of justification. 
right? How are we justified before a holy God, right? According to the Reformers, justification is the doctrine by which the church stands or falls. Justification is the doctrine that really distinguishes us from Catholicism. We can get so caught up in all the different things about Catholicism, you know, their worship and this and that, but really the doctrine of justification is one of the things that really, I mean, that's the whole Protestant Reformation, correct? Right? So when you listen to a church that's Protestant, a Bible church, that's, you know, you would think you're going to hear the Protestant doctrine of justification, Right? And that's the one thing you should expect that if you go to any Protestant church, you're going to get the doctrine of the justification like historical Protestant Christianity, right? That, 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 I think that's a fair expectation. You may not get the teaching the way you like it. You may not like the music. There's lots of things that there may be differences, but you can expect, hey, I should get the doctrine of justification. Well, <laughs> obviously not. It all, it, and I'll just, I'm going to go quickly and not review all the sermons on the Sermon on the Mount, but his approach to the Sermon on the Mount is a very common, there's, there's nine, probably about 12 different ways you can approach the Sermon on the Mount um, that's, that's shown up in church history. And one of a, a common approach by many Protestant, non-Catholic churches is that the Sermon on the Mount is a test. See, the way you get into the kingdom of God is by repenting. How do you know if your repentance is genuine? By checking it with the Sermon on the Mount. If you obey the Sermon on the Mount, your repentance is genuine. If you don't obey the Sermon on the Mount, your repentance is not genuine. Therefore, you're not a Christian. Now, there's lots of questions that should be raised at that point, right? How much obedience to the Sermon on the Mount must I possess to know if I am saved? And how much disobedience can be present before I have to acknowledge that my repentance is not genuine? And we have to also acknowledge that that kind of idea will lead you to one simple conclusion. Can you ever know if your salvation is secure? No, because you'd have to get to the end of your life and then say, okay, hey, can someone uh, pull up that, the Sermon on the Mount again? Because I need to check it to see if my life... And they'll say, well, that's not what we mean. But if you say it's a test, a test either is a test or a test isn't a test, Right. So, so that already was problem number one. He sets this up. Now, he also does the same thing that Protestants do. Hey, the Sermon on the Mount is the test, but guess what? Jesus came to make it possible for you to keep it. That sounds great, right? That sounds wonderful. However, you're not going to keep it perfectly. So you try to figure this out. It's a test in which my imperfection, my, my disobedience... My not passing the test is supposed to then somehow test to see if I am truly saved. So how can my failure to meet the standard be this test to determine? And then you see, what, what, the next question is you ask, so what did Jesus do? Because this sounds a lot like it's not how our salvation is based off what? What I do. So this, you see all the problems. Well, yesterday... Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. This is where things got, I'm still just in shock. It was like looking in the rearview mirror, realizing you get ready to get hit with a car. All right? Matthew chapter 5, or a truck in this particular case. Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Matthew 5, verse 20. Now remember, his, his whole argument is that this is a test, right? So Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. Jesus is speaking, right? For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Very strong words, right? Now, guess what he did? He said that righteousness right there is practical righteousness. Your practical righteousness must exceed that of the scribes and the Pharisees, and if it doesn't, you don't get into the kingdom of God. Now, Number one, what, what, when he means exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, what is, he, what is Jesus referring to there? Everybody in this church should be able to answer that question. What do you think? When he says it must exceed it, what is he referring to? Exceed it in what way? The scribes and the Pharisees had what kind of a righteousness? An external righteousness, right? External. Jesus is going and what is he trying to argue in the Sermon on the Mount? Not just your external action. 
It's your thoughts, it's your hearts, it's your motivation. So in other words, you have to have a righteousness that is better than just an external one. It has to be an internal one. Right there, you should already be in trouble, correct? But he's arguing that means your practical righteousness. So how do you know you get into the kingdom? So what, what, what's the thing that determines your entrance into the kingdom of heaven? The level of practical righteousness which you have. So that means, what did Jesus do? A high external righteousness, right? So it has to be matter there. But I'm saying, just think of what he just did. How, how, do you, how are you justified before God? By the practical righteousness which you demonstrate and possess. So that sounds like, what, what are we saved by? An imputed or an infused? That's an infused righteousness which you must maintain a certain level in order to get into heaven. That's being preached in a Protestant church. Now, I would argue that Jesus is absolutely right. My righteousness must exceed that. And where do I get a righteousness that will exceed that? From the one who not only preached the Sermon on the Mount, but what else did he do? He lived it. And guess what? His living of it is imputed to me, his passive and active will be. That's basic justification. This is justification 101. Right? Justification 101, which we have taught in this church a thousand times, even though we've been accused of not, you know, you never teach the gospel, you never teach justification. Give me a break. How many times have we studied this? A million times. It drives me crazy when someone says that. We've studied it a million times. But just consider, let's just jump a little further ahead in Matthew chapter 5. Look at verse 48. Matthew 5, 48. Same sermon. Remember, the sermon goes from Matthew 5 to Matthew 7. What does Jesus say in Matthew 5, 48? Be perfect. As your heavenly Father is, is perfect, right? Does he compare the perfection he's demanding as the perfection which God possesses? So what kind of perfection is that? Well, no, it's, I'm saying the perfection he's demanding there is an absolute perfection, right? It's not like, well, well, it's not, he's not describing a perfection that just describes the general bent of your life. No, he's talking about a absolute perfection. Well, immediately when you read that, what should be your response? I cannot do this. I cannot do this. Remember, Jesus played this game a lot. Remember the rich young ruler? Hey, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said, keep these. No, remember he said, first keep these commandments. And then what did he say? I've kept all of these. And Jesus said, okay, great. You've kept all of them. Go sell all of your possessions. Give to the poor. And the guy was like, okay, well, I guess I'm not. uh, What was he demonstrating? You really haven't kept them. You think you have, but you haven't. The demands of God's law are beyond your ability to keep them. That's the whole reason Jesus had to come. According to, so, I mean, according to this pastor, Jesus came just to make it possible for you to keep the law. So basically, Jesus came. Now, hey, Bobby, it's now possible. I'm going to do, I'm going to do this, give you a little bit of power. Boom. Now it's possible. You go keep the law. And now if you keep it good enough, you get damn it. Is that not Catholicism? And fuses you with righteousness, which you have to cooperate with. The only good thing about Catholicism, at least they have a system stra- uh, set up to at least explain how it all works. Okay, hey, Bobby, you committed a mortal. You've lost the grace of God. Now you've got to go through penance. You've got to go through confession. Now you try to get back into a state of, of grace. Are you ever going to be uh, good enough? No, so where are you going to have to go? Purgatory. At least they, they're, more, they're more honest than us as Protestants who just straight apply. I, I, I stated it yesterday in, in, in the review. I mean, because I was just, I was so dumbfounded that someone needs to call Luther and tell him the Protestant Reformation is over. It was a failure. I mean, it's just done. It's finished. The Protestant Reformation. I mean, if that's happening in a Protestant church, there's no point. Now, I know that pastor would say, no, that's not what I'm saying, but that's literally what he said. I mean, they are, the, we, we, we played the audio. It's right there. And, I, and I, yesterday, I spent an hour and 15 minutes reviewing six minutes of his sermon. Okay. Because I, I, because I, was, I was just dumbfounded. I was like, I can't believe what I'm reading. I can't believe what I'm hearing. I can't, I, 
I, I'm just, I still can't believe it. Now, I say all of that because where are we at in the Niagara Creed? We're now dealing with points that are very relevant to this subject. Points that, that if I was to read them, guess what? A lot of you would be like, we already know that. We already know that. We already know that. We already know that. But here's the thing. Here's the danger. When we start thinking, we already know that, we already know that, we already know that, then we, we stop thinking about it as important. And the next thing you know, when these other ideas creep in, we don't even catch it. Everyone in that church and Council Bluffs, Iowa, should have been like, whoa, 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 what just happened? What just happened to the doctrine of justification? Now, I, you know, you know what, what do you think led him to ultimately, in his preaching, completely deny, I'm telling you, the very doctrine they have in their, in, in their statement of faith? What was the thing, what was the engine that drove him to violate the very doctrine that he would claim to believe? He would claim to believe in the same understanding of justification. How did he end up violating it? What was the engine that drove it? Oh, no, okay, now, okay, now stay, now don't forget what I just said, because that's very important. But in this particular case, it was his hermeneutic. His hermeneutic set up the problem. What was his hermeneutic? The Sermon on the Mount is a test. That was the engine. If, if your hermeneutic violates your theology, then you've got, to do, you've got to do one of two things. Either change your theology or readdress your hermeneutic. There, there's nine different ways to approach the Sermon on the Mount. Why, why would he choose that one? Now, this is very, now, I, yeah, I, I'm glad you, y'all said the things you just said because this is, is important. Throughout church history, throughout church history, there has been, there's always been great concern with a doctrine that says that you are justified not because of what you do, but because of what Christ did. There's always been a concern. And what is that concern? What is the concern that always arises from a doctrine that says you're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, because of Christ alone? It's not by works. It's not according to anything you do. What is always the concern? People will live any way they want. So what we do is we try to fix that problem. But if the solution of the problem destroys the gospel then you've created another gospel, which according to Paul is not another gospel. It's a false gospel. And anyone who preaches a false gospel, according to Galatians chapter one, is to be anathema. You cannot fix that problem. Now we all want to fix it, right? Everybody's worried about that. Oh, oh, you know, we, we got to fix it. We got to fix it. We got to fix it. But let's think about all the solutions that's been offered throughout church history. Catholicism. Did it make people more righteous and more godly? Come on, no. You know Catholics. I've known Catholics. Are they any more godly? Church of Christ. Teaching you can lose your salvation. Did it make Church of Christ people any more godly, any more righteous? No. Every attempt doesn't fix it. Right? Because you think, you know what? If I I threaten you that, hey, if you don't do this, this, and this, you're going to go to hell... No, you, because you just, didn't, you just convince yourself, okay, it's going to be something really big, or, or you just live in utter fear that you go to the altar every week thinking you've got to be resaved every week. So that doesn't resolve the problem. So we, we have to make sure that at least for us, we can't fix every other church in the world. But what we can do is ensure that this church has at least a good understanding of this doctrine. So what we're going to use, we're going to use the Niagara Creed this morning. To just try to reestablish this basic teaching. All right, everybody ready? The Niagara Creed, everybody good? Remember what uh, paragraph we're on? Does anybody remember? Seven, okay. All right, we'll actually go back to six. We're going to go back to six because it puts it all together. The, par- the paragraphs before, remember, what, uh, paragraph one dealt with what? Scripture, right, because you've got to have the foundation. Then uh, the scriptures begin with God. So paragraph two dealt with God. And then paragraph three, four, and five pretty much dealt with what? Depravity and sin and the fall. Depravity, sin, fall, man, right? Because we got to know, look, before we can turn our attention to justification or salvation, we have to first realize the problem which we need to be saved from, right? 
And paragraph 3, 4, and 5 really established our depravity and our sin. All right, now, let's work through this. Everybody ready? Okay, here we go. Paragraph 6. We believe that our redemption has been accomplished solely by the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's stop right there. Okay, let's stop right there. Now, according to this, what is the, the, the absolute dogmatic claim that they are making? It's very straightforward, right there at the beginning. What's the dogmatic assertion that they are making? All right, the, our redemption was accomplished solely, is that, I think that's the word they used, right? Solely by what? The blood of Jesus Christ. And we could say, ultimately by the death or the work of Jesus Christ. I think we can, we can say that. What, but what's the important claim to take away from that? It's by Jesus, solely. That means I don't come along and say, okay, but well, he did it, but now if I don't do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, and I don't pass your test, his test, MacArthur's test, Jonathan Edwards' test, because everyone has a test, well, then I'm not saved. Well, then that immediately says it's not him solely, it's him plus me. And I know they say, no, 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 no. It's him alone, but if, if, if he, he has to do something in us and through us, but you're still taking, you're still turning it away from the imputed righteousness to an infused righteousness, which I have to demonstrate to a sufficient level to please someone. And nobody can ever tell us what that sufficient level is, right? Nobody. Nobody. So it, I want to just make sure. Now, what do you think? So, the, so he make, they make an assertion, right? We are, we are, our redemption is accomplished solely by the blood of Jesus Christ. Then, and the rest of the paragraph, what do they appear to be doing? They make first an assertion. It's solely by Jesus Christ. And what does the rest of the paragraph appear to be doing? Okay. Or, it, it, and in some ways, it's explaining how he did it, right? He did it, but now how did he do it, right? Does that make sense? What did he do? He saved you. Solely, your salvation is solely because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, how did that how did he accomplish that? And what's the first thing that they list? He was made to be sin. Okay, he was made to be sin. Yeah, he was made to be sin and made a curse for us. We'll go. We'll 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 name those as two things. He was made sin and made a curse. Now, what does it mean that he was made sin for us and a curse for us? Yeah, if he was made sin for us, clearly the implication is somehow my sin ends up where? On him. The curse for me ends up where? On him. Now just think about this logically. If we truly believe that, if my sin is on him and, my, and the curse is on him and he takes care of the sin and the curse, then can I come along and go, well, hey... Um, you got to do this, 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 this. Well, you've got this much disobedience, this much disobedience. Wait a minute. All of that disobedience would be covered by what? Now, that makes everyone nervous, right? Because, well, oh, so you're saying anybody can live any way they want. That, you, you, you can't, even if that is your concern, you can't change that teaching. You've got to deal with the first, the reality that all of my sin is on him and the curse is on him. So you can't come back and say, well, wait a minute, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you didn't do this. That Paul, that Paul constantly in Romans is saying, God forbid, God forbid. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that. Why is he saying God forbid? Because he, that's the, a, a normal attack. But but the point is, is we don't say that you should live in sin, but the point is it, you're going to sin. And think about it. You're going to live in sin because sin is going to be a continual and habitual practice in everyone's life. So you can't say a, a Christian can't live in sin because we live in sin. So then you have to define what you mean by live in sin. And so now we, it, it, you see, we played all these weird games and we can't play games like that. Who accomplished my redemption? Jesus Christ. 
How did he accomplish my redemption? Two things. His sin. My, he became sin and he became a curse. Everybody see that? And then what else did he do? Dying in our room and stead. Dying in our room and stead. What does that mean? He died for me. He died for me. He died in my place. And dying, he took care of what? Two things. Sin and the curse. Sin and the curse. Well, if he took care of sin and the curse, then what what do I look to for that salvation? What do I look for? Him. Not in the mirror. And I know people come along, no, 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 no. See, if you're truly saved, you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do this, but they can never tell me how much I have to do this, and what happens if I don't do this. Well, then you were never saved. And, and it just, it, it, well, it just destroys, it just destroys everything we're reading, right? You, you can't have both. I know, I know Christians want, they, I know what they're trying to do, but let me state it again. You cannot correct a problem by destroying truth. You got to maintain the truth of the gospel. How am I saved? By Jesus Christ alone. What did he do to save me? He became sin and a curse for me. And then what else did he do? He died for me in our place. So that means I can't die for my sins. Correct? And when I say death, I'm talking eternal death. I. I, I, it's done. I, I, I'm free from that. Or it's a lie. It's one, one, one or the other. I mean, you don't have a lot of options there. Okay. What else does the creed go on to say? And just remember, if someone's listening to us live currently, um, we've already looked at all of the scriptures pertaining to all of these. So, that, so I'm not breaking it down, going to each scripture. We've already read all of them. So if you missed that study, well, I, I can't fix that right now for you. All right. Uh, because I'll get someone, you didn't read any scripture. We've already read all these scriptures. Right now, we're just trying to figure out what the creed says. Okay, now, note the next part. So, how, who saved us? Jesus Christ. How did he do it? By becoming, a sin, by becoming sin and a curse for us and dying in our place. And note the next part. And that no repentance, repentance no feeling, no faith, No good resolutions, no sincere efforts, no submission to the rules and regulations of any church or of all the churches that have ever existed since the day of the apostles can add in the very least to the value of that precious blood. In other words, we can't add anything to what? To the finished work. We can't add anything. We can't do anything. So what's the proof of my salvation? Christ. Okay, we just got to make it. The proof of my salvation is Christ. I know we've all been taught the proof of my salvation is what? Me. My faith in Christ or my work or me, 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 me. It's me. No, it's got to be him. Because, Because my proof of my salvation will never be enough proof. Does that make sense? Because the minute you think, ooh, look at me, I proved I'm saved today. Five minutes later, <laughs> you're going to be proving that you were never saved. Do you see the problem with this? Well, right, well, I'll go back to the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus would, what would prove your salvation is not your external. It would be your internal, and nobody can judge that. But all the tests always focus on what? The external. Do this and you, well, I mean, some of them even try to go to the internal, which just becomes impossible. If you truly, if you're truly a Christian, you'll love God with all your heart, mind, body, and soul. Give me a break. Whoever does that, so you have to convince yourself that you do something that you literally don't do. And everyone who emails me and gets mad, usually within their email, they demonstrate that they're not even acting a Christian way because they're calling me names, they're threatening me. And you're like, okay, well, praise God. Clearly you lost your salvation. No, you can't lose your salvation. Well, you clearly never had it because look at the way you're emailing me, okay? Clearly you're demonstrating you've got a problem. But they don't see that because as long as they're not what? 
When it really comes down to, as long as they're not getting an abortion, selling drugs, or, you know, doing something really, really, really bad, then they're good. Because now they start changing what sin really is. And then that just becomes a problem. Let's continue. So he listed all the things that we cannot add. We, there's nothing we can do to add to the, uh, to the, to the least, to the value of precious little blood, or to the merit of that finished work. Or, uh, or to the merit of that finished work. We can't add anything to the finished work. Wrought for us by him, uh, wrought for us by him who united in his person true and proper divinity with perf- perfect and sinless humanity. What's the bottom line there? Jesus did it. We didn't. Jesus did it. We can't add to it. Jesus did it. And we can't take anything from it. Correct? Nothing I can do. I can take, can t- take to it. So what do I look? Again, what is the basis of my salvation? Christ. What is the basis of my assurance? Christ. What is the hope of my security? Christ. That's it. Now, I know that people w- w- want to raise nine, but, but, but you're, are you saying that people can live any way they want? You're, you're, you're rejecting the, the fundamental teaching here of, because of a concern. Now, everyone may have that concern, but look at every attempt to fix that concern. Has any of them worked? No. Why? Because that concern can't fix what reality? Now, stay with me here because this is going to be very important in the next hour because we've been talking about this in Romans. No matter what we hope to, f- to fix this problem, what ki- nothing we can do can change what reality? That in you and that in me, what are, we are still, we still have sinful nature and what is going to be the reality of everyone's Christian life? Sin. Sin. Our struggle. Maybe struggle should be a better way of putting it, but sin is still going to be there. Now, yes, we should be struggling against it, but sin is going to be there. To deny that reality. And this is why Christians, Christians, we don't have a theology. We don't, we, we, we have a theology of sin before salvation, but we don't seem to have a good theology of sin after salvation. Because it's like, before salvation, you can commit all the sins in the world, you walk into the church, say you believe in Jesus, and it's all gone and it's good. But from that point forward, we don't seem to know what to do. Right? Oh no! Someone did that! Oh no! Someone did Oh no! Someone did Oh no! And they're like, I'm going to lose my faith! I don't know what to do! I was just reading an article today about someone because of the Ravi Zacharias situation. And she's, you know, she doesn't know what to do with her faith anymore. Because she, like, she's shocked! I'm like 2,000 years of church history and what I wanted, I, I would love to be able to write the woman who wrote the article and go, how about you, instead of looking at Ravi Zacharias, how about you look in the mirror? You may not have committed those egregious sins, but you sin every single day. That's why I don't, I don't get how Christians can, can convince themselves that we're more godly than we are. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Well, that's what it becomes. It becomes about you trying to convince other people or trying to convince yourself. We're trying to convince someone. But the one thing we cannot do is add or do any. We, I mean, Jesus either did it or he didn't do it. I, I, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's either he did or he didn't. And, and what it seems that what's happening in some Protestant churches is we want to say Jesus did some things, but we've got to do the rest. And even, but we just find a little clever way of saying, no, we're saved by grace alone through faith alone, but the, the faith that saves doesn't remain alone. That sounds good, right? That preach is good. But what do you mean by that? Well, unless this shows up, you're not saved. So then am I saved by grace? No, you are saved by grace and through faith alone. But if it doesn't do this, this, and this, then it was never truly salvation. It just, right. So then you're real, no matter how many ways we try to rephrase it, what do we end up with? A salvation by works. Okay, next paragraph. Let's go through these quickly. All right. Uh, paragraph seven. We believe that Christ 
in the fullness of the blessings he has secured by his obedience unto death is received by faith alone and that the moment we trust in him as Savior, we pass out of death into everlasting life, being justified from all things accepted before the Father according to the measure of his acceptance, loved as he is loved. In other words, loved the way the Father loves the Son. He loves us. Having his place and portion. Whose place? Christ. Whose portion? Christ. As linked to him and one with him forever. So that means what? I stand What's my standing before God? My standing before God is the same standing that Christ has before the Father. So guess what that means? Before the Father, what are the things that are true about me, my standing before the Father? I am perfectly holy, perfectly obedient. I've kept all the law, and I'm completely seen and for, well, I'm for, I'm not only am I forgiven, I'm seen to not have absolutely how much sin? Zero sin. Because I am, I am seen in what way? As Christ is seen. That's, that's the whole teaching. Well, if that's true, okay, you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this. But in my position, what does God see? Christ. Did he do any of those things? No. Do I excuse doing those things? Absolutely not. But if I run around saying, "Uh uh-oh, you did this, you're not saved. Uh Uh-oh, you're not saved. Uh Oh, you're not saved. You're not saved. You're not saved. You're not. And I always say, well, we're not saying that. But if you have a test, we've listened. How many times have we talked about this? I've even brought the test here to read them. And all of those tests, what do they never explain to us? How much, how much is required to get a passing grade? What's a failing grade and what's a passing grade? They can't say. Well, then, if... At the end of the test, but no one's going to do this perfectly. Well, then, and so how can I... So is the test perfect or imperfect? Well, the test is perfect, but I'm imperfect. But somehow it's going to still give me a passing grade? Based off what? Like, and you see, when I, when I do that, I know I'll get these emails when people say, you're just being absurd. No, you're dealing with someone's eternal destination. That's not absurd. Everyone should be trying to figure out exactly how this works. Exactly how this works. And the Sermon on the Mount can't be the test because no one's going to pass it. Right? So according to this, let's read that again. We believe that Christ, that Christ in the fullness of the blessings he has secured by his obedience unto death. He secured the blessings. That's why in Christ we have how many blessings? All spiritual blessings. All spiritual blessings. That's why I argue that the Beatitudes, right? When we read those Beatitudes, we want all those blessings in Matthew 5, right? Well, who who accomplished all of the requirements for those Beatitudes? Christ. In Christ, I have all of those blessings. In Christ, not in myself, because just look at the, those Beatitudes. Pure in heart, we'll see God. Anybody here pure in heart? Anybody? Who was pure in heart? So in Christ, I get to see God, right? In other words, I get to see the Father, right? Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, To, there may be moments I hunger and thirst after right, but that's not the common, I hunger and thirst after righteousness. But who did? Christ, to me, Christ is the blessed person of Matthew 5, of the Beatitudes, and I get the blessings through Christ. But if you change it into a test, then you go through the Beatitudes, and if I don't do this, and I don't do this, I don't do this, then I'm not saved, I'm not saved, I'm not saved, I'm not saved. Before I even get through the Beatitudes, I would already be condemned. And come on, and you would too. Don't even pretend that you wouldn't be. That's what I, I told my friends in Nebraska. I was like, I don't know about your church. I said, I don't know about your church. But as far as my church, all of my people are going to hell. Okay, they're all going to hell, including me. Including me. I, I said, so you, you guys must have figured it out. 
but we haven't figured it out. Maybe it's just a difference between Iowa and Texas, but here in Texas, well, I guess we just can't figure it. We, we're just too ungodly. Maybe that's the problem. I don't know, but I, or maybe you're just all living in a land of denial. But the point is, is, is pe- people hear that preaching and they never even catch on. We're literally, literally destroying the doctrine of justification. They're literally destroying the doctrine of justification. And a church that's not Catholic. I, I told my friends, I said, y'all need to change your church, name of your church, and jo- become, become you know, a Catholic church. And I'd be, if people there heard that, they would be offended. But I'm like, that, that's better Catholicism than Catholicism. Or it's actually, it's a more imperfect version. of. I think Catholicism is a better system. At least it explains it. Let's look at some of these scriptures really quick. Right, we're, we're, we've got to stop here in a minute. Uh, go to John. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you the scriptures. Y'all look them up, and and so, and I'm gonna have you summarize what they're what they're telling us. John five twenty four. Someone look that one up first. John five twenty four. Five twenty four. Gonna make you do some work. John five twenty four. Who's there? John 5, 24, someone want to read it out loud. Loud. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. It will not be condemned. He has crossed over from death to life. Okay, so what's, what's, the, what's John 5, 24 telling us? Belief in Christ removes me from what? Death unto life. By what? Faith. By faith. By believing. It doesn't say... You believe, and then if you do, then you prove you believed. Now, I understand there's other passages that seem to be, I understand. Everyone goes to 1 John, it says 1 John is a test. 1 John tests your salvation. Everyone says that. I know that. I've been taught that my whole Christian life. 1 John is the test book. 1 John is the test book. First John, And I understand, 1 John is definitely complicated and difficult. I just know that if you're truly honest when you read 1 John, you would conclude that what? That you're not saved. So then what do you have to do? It's a test, but it, it's just saying if I, if I just kind of generally go in that direction. I mean, how many tests do you go in, in, into college and say, as long as you kind of demonstrate in this test that you have the general idea, you get a passing grade? No. You, it's either right or wrong. <laughs> Right? It's like, well, you kind of got the general idea there. No. So, but God's test, I guess, is different. As long as we're, so, so even when people say First John is the test, I'm always like, fine. And you're, and you're writing me to tell me you passed that test? Because it's absurd if you think you pass it. Pass it. All right. That's for, uh, that was John, uh, that was John 5, 24. How about John 17, 23? John 17, 23. Okay. Okay, I was like, that doesn't make any sense. Okay. I am in them, and you and me may be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you sent me and have loved me even as you have loved me. Okay, what's the, what's the emphasis there? John seventeen twenty three. Right. Or that we're united to Christ, right? Would we agree with that? Okay, John seventeen twenty three. I'll read it again, uh, Matthew. John seventeen twenty three. I'll read it. I in them, and thou in me, that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Right, we're in Christ. The love for the Father has for the Son. He has for us because we're in Christ. We're united to Christ. We are, we are seen as being in him. Right? Does that make sense? All right. Next, uh, Acts 13.30. Acts 13.30. All right. <clears throat> God, uh, let's see. Acts 13.30. I mean, let me look at the context there for a second. I think I know what they're doing there, but that's okay. Acts 13.30. Yeah, I, I, it's it's always crazy when they, they just grab a verse like that. You have to figure out what's going on. I think what they're saying, um, 
We go back to the verse 29. And when they had fulfilled all that was written of him, they took him down from the tree and laid him in a sepulcher. But God raised him from the dead. I guess the point is God raised him from the dead. If I'm in Christ, I've been raised from the dead. Think of it this way. I've been raised from the dead spiritually and I will be raised from the dead physically. There'll be a physical resurrection. All right. Again, just my my what, what happens to Christ happens to us. I think that's the emphasis they're trying to make, especially when you read the paragraph that we just read. Um, that was Acts 13.30, right? Next, Romans 5.1. Romans 5.1. I'm going to run out of time here. Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2, verse 4. Ephesians 2, 4, everybody there. But God, who is rich in mercy, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together. See, please note, quickened us together with Christ. That quickened means what? Made alive. He raised Christ from the dead, right? He's raised us with, with Christ. By grace are ye saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Well, how am I sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus? Because where is Christ? At the right hand of the Father. Where am I? At the right hand of the Father. In my position. Again, we've got to get that, that concept down. We have to get that concept down. Um, and then, the, uh, was, is it verse 13? Verse 13? Oh, same, same passage, Ephesians 2.13. But now in Christ Jesus, please note, but now what? In Christ Jesus, you were sometimes were afar off or made nigh by the blood of Christ. What does it mean? We're, we're brought near by the blood of Christ. Right? And then 1 John 4.17. We're going to run out of time. 1 John 4.17. 1 John 4.17. All right, everybody there? 1 John 4, 17, make sure I'm looking at it correctly. All right, it says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. And why can we have boldness in the day of judgment? Because we're in Christ. We're in Christ. So when I stand before God, what, what, what am I, what's going to be judged? What can be judged when I stand before Christ? Nothing, because it's already been judged. Now, we could argue there's a judgment of works, and that's going to just determine what we have done, but that has nothing to do with our salvation, right? I mean, we, there's no way it can have anything to do with our salvation, because if, if we're going to be judged according to our works in our salvation, then none of us are going to be saved. And then, first, is it First John 5, 11 through 12? First John 5, 11 through 12, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is... In his son. Where is that life? In his son. He that hath the son hath life, and he that hath not the son of God hath not life. Having the son is what matters. So what, what, what can we say? My justification is determined by whom? Jesus Christ. His finished work. I can't add anything to it. If I'm in him, what do I have? Life. If I'm in him, what do I have? I've been resurrected. If I'm in him, what do I have? All of the blessings. If I'm in him, where am I seated? At the right hand of the Father. None of that has anything to do with what I do. And somehow we connect, we, we somehow think the proof of what he did is what I do. I want you to hear that again. Somehow in the American Christian Protestant church, we think the thing that proves what he did is what I do. If I do this, then that proves he did that for me. But has that ever been the proof? That can't be the proof. What I do can't be the proof of what he did. What's the proof of what he did? What he did, right? That's the proof of what he did, right? 2,000 years ago, he hung on a cross and bled and died, was buried and rose on the third day. What's required of me? Literally, at, on one side, 
Two things are required, repentance and faith. But what do we believe, especially in this church? That repentance and faith is given to (laughs) to us by him. That's not even from ourselves. Right? So, So what's the proof of what he did? It can't be what I do. We want to prove that what Jesus did was effect, effectual by what we do, but that turns justification not into a forensic justification, a legal declaration. Remember we talked about forensic justification? That, we, that What does justification not do? Let's remind ourselves. What does justification not do? Doesn't change us. I want to make sure we drive that point. Justification doesn't change us. If you say it does, you're a Catholic. Okay. It doesn't change us. What, it, it doesn't change us in, our, in, our, in, the, in the way, in other words, I don't become righteous because of what he did. I am declared righteous. Remember, this, Catholics hate that. Like when, when, when Catholics hear us say that, they laugh, they mock, they think it's stupid, they think it's foolish, they think it's ridiculous. Okay? But I'm saying you mock it all day. Okay, You mock it all day. Show me your righteousness. Show me your righteousness because you supposedly have an infused righteousness. Live it out because all you see, I mean, the, the, the church that has an infused righteousness had one of the largest scandals in history of molesting little kids. Well, way to go with that infused righteousness. That, woohoo! Yeah, I, I wouldn't, I would be very quick to mock us. You know, that's what, because some of the Catholic podcasts, I really want to throw things. You're going to mock our teaching of an, of an imputed righteousness when you had one of the ho- most horrible scandals that you've paid out uh, probably close to a billion dollars now and trying to, co- trying to take care of all the cases. That, that's, that would make me question infused righteousness really quick. Because, hey, we got infused righteousness and all these sacraments help us and they give us power and they give us strength and you've committed one of the most horrible. Now, to be fair, those same kinds of sins have happened in the Protestant churches, right? Because guess what's true of Protestants and Catholics? We're sinners! (laughs) And teaching that you're infused or that you're somehow magically changed by justification. So what changes in justification? Not my person, not my nature... My standing. Because I'm still standing there an unworthy sinner. But what happens? Righteousness is imputed to me. And, and, th- and so now you can't turn around and say, now, no, the way you prove your justification is based off what you do. No, because my justification is not supposed to do anything. Sanctification is, but that sanctification is the process where I try to live out what is true Positionally, and am I ever, but I can never use my sanctification as the means of proving my justification. Because the minute you do that, what have you just destroyed? The doctrine of justification. You can't say, well, look at you. Look at you. You're not a Christian. Okay, well, am I a Christian based off what Christ did or am I a Christian based off what I do? You ju- by that very statement, you just made my Christianity determined by what? By what I do. Don't you see how that destroys the whole teaching? And I understand the concern. Pelagius had the same concern, right? This weak Christianity, we got to fix it, right? So, hey, you're not depraved. You can do it. Did it work? Nope, didn't work. The Lordship salvation came along. Hey, 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 all Lordship salvation did was convince a whole lot of people that they weren't saved. Did it make anyone more godly? No. Because you can't fix the reality. The reality that we must cling to is the finished work of Jesus Christ. So I just, I don't know what else to say other than trying to drive that point home. home. And I know you're thinking, well, we know this. I know we know this, but there's a church that literally would claim to believe what we believe who literally just denied the entire doctrine of justification. In one sermon, in six minutes of a sermon, they just basically said, Luther, boom, gone, gone. Justification by grace alone, through faith alone, boom, gone. They literally, and, and I hate to say that, and I, I, I was trying to be very careful with saying this to my friends, but I'm like, pretty cl- your church pretty much is now in Galatians 1 territory. And that would mean anathema. Because you either have the right gospel or you have the wrong gospel. There is no compromise there. 
But did they intend to do that? No. Would, they, would, would the pastor deny that they're doing that? Yes. But you have to look at what's actually being taught. Somehow we have to maintain my salvation is, fi- is finished in Christ. What I do, I can't become the thing that proves what Christ did. It can't become the proof of it. Because then, that, then you're telling me that justification was designed not to give me imputed righteousness, but to give me an infused righteousness. And so how can I prove I have an infused righteousness? By demonstrating that infused righteousness. How can I demonstrate an imputed righteousness? I can't because it's imputed, right? Okay, so let's stop right there. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you this morning. This is a very serious subject, Lord, very serious Everyone in this room, we've had all kinds of different views about justification. We've all struggled trying to figure out how justification works with sanctification. We've, we've come up with so many ideas and theories, but whatever we ever settle on, let it never destroy the doctrine of justification by grace alone, through faith alone, because of your son alone. Because anything that does that becomes a false gospel and we become anathema. Protect us from that. Help us see what's happening in churches around us and let us do everything we can to equip one another and to equip others to to truly, truly hold on and cling to the justification that we believe is taught in your word. And we ask this in Jesus' name. And God's people said,